Across the 19 main series Zelda games, Link's travelled through countless dungeons, battled against all kinds of foes, and discovered untold secrets. But for all the content that made it into the main Zelda games, there's a huge amount that was left on the table. Concepts, ideas, sometimes even fully designed assets that, for whatever reason, didn't make it into the final release. So today, just like we've done with Easter eggs, let's run through the whole Zelda series in order of release and discuss an interesting unused idea or a piece of cut content from each. The main Zelda theme is among the most iconic songs in video games, but this almost wasn't the case. The song was composed in a single day by Koji Kondo when the Zelda team realised that copyright had not yet expired on the song they originally intended to use, Bolero by Maurice Ravel. It's a piece of classical music you've probably heard before, but it's incredible to think that this would have played instead of the classic Zelda theme on the NES, perhaps something like this. Adventure of Link has the player travel across a larger Hyrule than its predecessor, on a different scale too. The overworld screen, where Link moves between palaces and towns, and the 2D side-scrolling levels. When you encounter an enemy on the overworld screen, it'll transition to a battle in 2D, with a background suited to the area you're in, like forests or deserts. There's actually an unused battle screen in the game's files. Usually, there's no enemy battles on mountain tiles, but if you use a cheat to trigger one, you'll enter an eerie graveyard battle area not used anywhere in the game. A Link to the Past marked the debut of many classic Zelda enemies, including the Soldiers, Hyrulean warriors brainwashed by Aghanim and used to serve his dark purposes. There were a bunch of different soldier varieties, from the basic types all the way up to the mighty ball and chain wielding varieties. But there was another type planned during development, one that's actually present and fully functional in the game's code the Cannon Soldier. This enemy uses a handheld cannon to fire spiked balls at Link, and was likely cut late into development. Link's Awakening introduced many classic themes to the Zelda series, like having a talking owl guide Link through his quest. The Owl on Koholint predates Ocarina of Time's Kopora Gabora, but it seems that during development, this might not have always been the case. We can find the sprites for a hooded old man. Since the original, mysterious old men have guided Link on his adventures, so it's possible that before the Owl, this was the case on Koholint Island too. Of all the urban legends surrounding Ocarina of Time, few are as widely known as the Unicorn Fountain. This strange site appeared in pre-release screenshots, and seemed to be a place resembling a fairy fountain, but with statues of unicorns adorned with the Triforce in the centre. Ever since this, the mystery of the Unicorn Fountain has prompted countless stories about what it is and what it does, where it is and how to access it, everything from the this is where Link can unlock the Sword Beam ability to this being the secret location of the Triforce itself. Unfortunately, the fountain doesn't appear anywhere in the game's files, meaning it was probably nothing more than an early version of a fairy fountain that was changed before release. Majora's Mask opens with a curse. Link is transformed into a diminutive Deku by the Skull Kid. He reclaims his own body by using the Song of Healing, which seals the Deku's spirit inside a mask, allowing him to transform back at any time. However, it seems that during development, this mechanic would have been slightly different, and a lot more unsettling. There's concept artwork of Link, in his Deku form, wearing a Link mask, and we can find this mask in the game's files. Even more curiously, this mask is found in the Skull Kid's object, suggesting that at some point, he might have worn this mask. What the story and gameplay implications of this would be are unknown. The Oracle games tell the story of Twin Rovers' attempt to resurrect Ganon, using their servants Onox and Varan to terrorise two separate lands. At the end of a linked game, the pair sacrifice themselves to bring back their master, and the final boss fight is against a feral, raging Ganon. 
But there's concept art for Ganondorf in his Gerudo form, in a really interesting dark wizard looking getup. Obviously, Ganondorf never made it into the Link's Oracle games, so this concept piece is all that remains from this idea. Four Swords was developed by Capcom, the studio behind other Zelda games like the Oracles and the Minish Cap. The game features much of the same art and assets as the Minish Cap, but this wasn't always the case. In beta builds of the game, the four Links had a very different design, with brown sleeves like the classic Links. Despite being set on the Great Sea, a mystical ocean formed from a flood sent by the gods to drown the ancient kingdom of Hyrule, the Wind Waker doesn't allow Link to explore underwater. In the previous 3D Zelda games, Link could explore the depths with various items, like using the Zora Mask to swim or the Iron Boots to sink to the bottom. The Iron Boots do appear in the Wind Waker, but they're primarily used to stand your ground against gusts of wind. But there was another item planned that was related in some way to water, the Water Boots. All that remains of this item in the game's files is a placeholder item with an icon that reads Water Boots in Japanese. You can use the item, and it'll make Link hop like he does when he puts on the iron boots, but nothing else. We don't know what the water boots would have done. Perhaps they'd have let him swim underwater, walk on its surface, or something else. The Minish Cap features a bunch of classic Zelda items. A magical ocarina, Pegasus boots, the rock's cape, even a magical cane like in A Link to the Past. But at one point, there was going to be another. The Fire Rod. A sprite for the Fire Rod can be found in the game's files, and it could be that it was removed quite late into development. In the European version of the game, the trophy description for the Ice Whiz Robe mentions a weakness to the Fire Rod. The files also include the pickup text, reading, You got the Fire Rod. This mystical rod shoots forth mighty flames, as well as text suggesting that the item might have been bought from a shop for the price of 350 rupees. Most of the Minish Cap's fire-related combat and puzzle solving is done with the Flame Lantern in the final version, so perhaps the team felt that the Fire Rod was an unnecessary addition. Speaking of unused classic Zelda items, Four Swords Adventures was apparently going to feature the Lens of Truth, the Sheikah artifact from Ocarina of Time in Majora's Mask that allows its user to see hidden things. There's a new, unique sprite for the lens in the game's files, not a reused sprite from a previous game, suggesting that the Four Links would have made use of this legendary item. The Lens of Truth is powered by magic. While it's activated, Link's magic meter will drain. A magic meter was something of a staple of the series ever since Adventure of Link, appearing in A Link to the Past, Ocarina and Majora, and The Wind Waker. But not Twilight Princess. Items that you'd assume would drain magic power, like the Dominion Rod, instead just have unlimited uses. But this wasn't always the case. During development, a magic meter was planned, and it was cut out extremely late in development. In fact, we can see the magic meter in a screenshot that features on the game's box. As well as this, it's possible to obtain green chew jelly in the final game, which likely would have replenished Link's magic meter. But without the meter, it does nothing, and in the original game just has a glitchy, empty pickup text. During Phantom Hourglass, Link must obtain an item called the Sun Key in order to open a sun door in the old Wayfarer's hideout in order to access the Temple of Courage. And it seems that there was originally going to be a second door in this style, a moon door. No, not that one. The game's files also make reference to an item called the Moon Key, which suggests that this cut door would have functioned similarly to its sun counterpart. What would have been locked behind it is a mystery. Towards the end of Spirit Tracks, Link ventures into the sinister Dark Realm to defeat the Demon Train and rescue Zelda's possessed body. It's a strange, eerie world latticed in train tracks, and it's where the game's final battles take place. But it seems that during development, there were plans for an entire dungeon in the Dark Realm. We can find the unused model for a Dark Realm temple station platform in the files. A playable Princess Zelda is something that many fans of the series have wanted to see for years. We haven't had a full game based around her since the critically acclaimed Zelda's Adventure on the CDI. 
but this was actually planned for Skyward Sword. Throughout much of the game, Link is following in Zelda's footsteps as she travels around the surface to unlock the latent powers within her, and the memories of her previous divine life. And there's a note in Hyrule Encyclopedia that mentions that during development, the team considered turning this journey into a fully playable second quest. Unfortunately, this never happened, but we get a glimpse at the story it would tell in the game's credit sequence, which shows various scenes of Zelda's adventure on the surface. A Link Between Worlds central mechanic allows Link to merge with walls and move along them as a painting. This allows for some really fun puzzle solving and fight sequences, and at one point, this mechanic would have been even bigger. Link was originally going to have the ability to jump while in his painting form. This would allow him to move around not just linearly, but more like a 2D platformer. Aonuma mentions that there was a time during development where Link was jumping around like Mario, but the concept was abandoned in order to not confuse players. Triforce Heroes is the latest in the series of multiplayer Zelda games, bringing multiple players together to control multiple links. There are obviously three controllable heroes this time around, but there was an idea for another multiplayer mechanic fusing two players together into a single link that they both controlled. Director Hiramasa Shikata mentioned that this fused link would only move in a direction if both players controlling him wanted to move that way, a mechanic which, understandably, ended up being very difficult to control and was taken out. Breath of the Wild's Great Plateau has long been a mystery, mainly because it features ruins that closely match up to Ocarina of Time's Castle Town. Which is strange, considering the fact that the plateau's main gate faces north, and the plateau itself is found in the south of central Hyrule, not somewhere in the north, with the gate facing south like you'd expect if it really was the ruins of Castletown. This has sparked a lot of discussion and theories, one in particular, popularised by Nintendo Black Crisis, suggesting that the Great Plateau actually swapped places with the Korok Forest. Both landmasses are a similar size and shape, and having the Korok Forest somewhere in the south would make sense. As it's a plateau suspended high above the land surrounding it, it's easy to see why some people believe that the plateau wasn't always here. Well, while the idea of the plateau and the Korok Forest swapping is just a theory, we know for a fact that some landscape switching happened during development. Director Manabu Takihara mentioned in an interview that Kakariko Village and the Korok Forest's locations were swapped. I began to feel that the two locations were out of place. I consulted with the landscape lead about switching the two around, and was met with a quick, certainly. The game's art director adds that switching the towns was a considerable amount of work. So, while we don't know if the Great Plateau was originally found somewhere else on the map, we do know for certain that the Korok Forest was. Placing Kakariko Village here instead makes it match up much more closely with its location in Ocarina of Time and Twilight Princess, right at the foot of Death Mountain. Thanks for watching this video. This video really wouldn't have been possible without the incredible cutting room floor, linked in the description, which really is an amazing source for all things cut from video games. Another note, the idea for this video, along with the easter eggs video, was inspired by a pair of videos by Dutch Bond fan. If you're into your James Bond films, go and give them a watch, they're great. Cheers guys, and I'll see you next time.